So starting again, force due to gravity is just a force of attraction between any two masses at a, at a given distance between their centers of mass. And so if we wanted to draw it, one object can be bigger than the other. They don't have to be. But the R value is the distance between their centers of mass. Oopsie, center of mass. Some formulas will write it as a d squared, some as an r squared. They always mean the distance between their centers of mass. Okay, they're, they're not trying to mess you up with radius versus diameter or something like that. It's just the distance between their centers of mass. And we might have m1 and m2. And like I say, uh, in my childhood textbook for physics, the capital M was usually used for the larger one. The lowercase m was usually used for the smaller one. And if you're talking about a planetary system with a satellite, that's actually a nice sort of visual reminder for you, just so, just so you know which one is the planet and which one is the satellite. But it, it really doesn't matter that much. Either one could be M1. Okay. And we talked last year about Cavendish's experiment and some sort of a, a torsion apparatus to show where this G may have come from. But we said that G was equal to 6.67 times 10 to the power of negative 11 now the units are something of a, of a difficulty. Obviously if it's a force, there's gonna be Newtons built into the units. But in the formula, I've got kilogram times kilogram, so that's gonna to have to be canceled out in my constant. So I'm gonna to have to have kilograms squared on the bottom to cancel out the kilograms times kilograms in the masses for this constant. What would I have to have in the top? Meter yeah, meter squared to get rid of, to cancel out this meter squared that's gonna be in the bottom. Okay, so if you ever forget the units, it's very logical. You can just go back to the formula, and the formula basically tells you what the units are. Okay, and I know it's a messy set of units, so people get messed up on them fairly easily. Now we don't have. Or not we, that's people used. haven't done that. Yeah, well, maybe they should. Maybe you know, maybe you could insert a Greek letter there. You know, like six point six seven times ten to the negative eleven gamma or something like that. Maybe because G for gravity, right? Yeah. Maybe somebody someday will think to do that, but at this point, we're not there. So. The CC. <laughs> All right, so that's our G constant. And so that's, that's really our grade 11 content. Now, what we've said so far is that work is equal to force times displacement. And so you might think that if I'm trying to figure out how much work it takes to get from the surface of a planet up to here, that you could use F big G with the gravitational constant to do that calculation and you might think that you could just throw in your displacement there and say oh okay well force through gravity times displacement that must be the work that it takes to take something from the surface of a planet this is a planet up to a given height can anybody see the flaw in that logic yep. yeah It doesn't work. There's a, there's a reason why that simple approach doesn't work. Yeah. Because gravity becomes significantly weaker over distance. Yeah, well, gravity drops off in its strength. Yeah, yeah. Uh, inverse squarely, right? So it's gonna if the force of gravity diminishes between this point and this point, you can't just say that the force it takes to lift something is going to be f big g because the value for f big g is going to change. And so really, I mean, we have to admit and. I, I mention this from time to time that underpinning a lot of these things is a lot of calculus. There is. Okay? So to try and take this idea over to, to some sort of a formula that I can use for F big G is going to involve some calculus. I just want to give you th the formula because we don't have any powers of integration yet or anything <coughs> like that under our belts. But it's maybe someday you look back and you say, ah, oh, I can see that that was something to do with integration. I don't want to go into the integration side of things right now. What I will say is that the amount of gravitational potential energy that something has when it's at a, a distance away from a center of mass, or the gravitational potential energy between two masses, is equal to G times M1 times M2 over R. And actually, it's, it's actually negative of that value. Not R squared, over R. Or well, you can put the negative on the outside if you want to. I just didn't write it out nicely. Okay. I want to throw out some values, and I want to do a little bit of calculation to see how much uh, work it would take to get from one position to another position. So here's a planet. 
let's call it uh, let's call it, let's call it Garth. Garth, G for gravity, and almost like Earth. Okay. So planet Garth. <laughs> I wouldn't say very funny, but anyways. All right. Oh, punny, not funny. All right. So we're going to take this, this mass that's sitting on the surface of Garth. And I want to... <laughs> I want to take it up to some height. Okay. So on this fictitious planet, this planet itself has a radius... Nice round numbers. Let's make it have a radius of 1.00 times 10 to the power of 4 meters. Yeah, it's a small planet. Planetoid. Okay? And I want to take my object up to a height so that... And I, I can say, well, the difference between these two vectors is the altitude. But I want to take it up to a height such that its new distance away from the center of mass of, of planet Garth is equal to 2.00 times 10 to the power of 4 meters. Okay? And so I could say this is position 1 and this is position 2 for my mass. Now the mass of the planet, we'll call it mass 1, is equal to 5.00 times 10 to the power, oopsie, 10 to the power of 20 kilograms. And I want to say that my, my object that I'm taking up, and you know the object might be a rocket ship or something like that that's blasting off of the planet. So I won't get it too fancy because I want you to be able to draw it easily. I want to say that the mass of my object is equal to, uh, I don't know, what, what's a good mass for a rocket, you think? A couple tons? Five tons? Okay. Well, let's, let's avoid the five. Let's say... Uh, uh, three tons. Three tons? Yeah. Okay. 3.00 times 10 to the power of 3 kilograms. Yeah? We're neglecting the fact that it'll get lighter as it goes away, right? Well, we're not neglecting that. No, that's, that's well, actually... Like due to uh, fuel loss. Oh, because, it, yes, we're neglecting the, the fuel loss issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's not make it too complicated. <laughs> Come on. All right. So here's what I want you to do. Um, we've got enough information at this point. I want you to take a minute, and I want this side of the room to find the gravitational potential energy at position 1. And I would like this side of the room to find the gravitational potential energy at position 2. Okay? So EG1 and EG2. EG1 is going to be at R1, and EG2 is going to be at R2. One uh, uh, ten thousand meters and twenty thousand meters away from the center of mass. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Uh, you know what? I can take some time and I can show you that in the math afterwards. I don't want to overcomplicate the screen with, with the derivation of the formula. Right now, it's just going to be a mathematical formula that I'll just present you with as something that's true, OK? Has anybody got one of these guys? Yeah, it's supposed to be negative. OK, my brackets might be wrong, but I think I got it. Okay, did anybody get EG1? Yeah. Nice. Negative 1.0005 times 10 to the power of negative 10. Oh, sorry, pow positive 10. Positive 10. And for EG2? 
Cece? Okay, I got negative 5.0025 times 10 to the 17, so I don't know. 2, 5. Uh, times 10 to the power of what? 17. I feel like my brackets were off, but I don't know. Does anybody want to second that motion? Oh, I can double check on the calculator, no problem. Yes, ma'am? Uh, EG1, it's a negative sign. Mm -hmm. Mr. Pellins, yep. both got it to the power of 9. Oh, to the power of, oh, you know what, I just double checked it and I got it to the power of 9 as well. Okay, so 10 to the power of 9. Okay, so those are the two gravitational potential energies. And you would expect, coming back to our diagram, you would expect that between here and here is where all the work is done, right? And what we've said before is the amount of work that you do on something is equal to its, well, its change in its gravitational potential energy, right? The way that I did work to this thing was to change its gravitational potential energy by pushing it upwards, maybe with a rocket engine, maybe by some giant just lifting it. But somehow, I did some work to change its gravitational potential energy. So how can I figure out how much work was done on this thing? What does delta EG really mean? What's, what's it code for? Change. Yeah, change in. So EG2 minus EG1, right? I think we could do that calculation. We could say that the work in this case is really just delta EG or EG2 minus EG1. And that's going to be a negative value minus a negative value, but when you subtract away a negative value, remember you're adding. So a negative 5.0025 times 10 to the power of 9 minus negative 1.0005 times 10 to the power of 10. Oh, and I dropped out my units of joules. Bad me. Has anybody got it? Paige? Oh, okay. let's just get the answer and then I'll answer all the questions. Yeah? Um, 5.0025 times 10 to the power of 9. <laughs> Turns out that the gravitational potential energy that I started off with sort of disappears, right? Oh, it's positive. Oh, you're right. Oh, because it was exactly half. Exactly half because I doubled my distance away from the center of mass. Anyways, the, the answer is a positive value. That's, that's the point. Your change in gravitational potential energy is always going to be positive, even though your individual gravitational potential energy at a position, at a specific position is negative, okay? So th that should fix some, some issues. Just give me one second. 